Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is Morten Sluder. I'm the chair of the Department of Religious Studies, which is the department that's, that's putting on this, this uh, uh, great lecture. Uh, and I really want to want to welcome all of you tonight. I'm very happy to see you. I want to apologize, I'm a little clumsy here, but I had knee surgery last week. and I'm still kind of learning how to walk again, it feels like. So, uh, but I'm working on it, and it's getting there. So welcome everybody, I'm really happy to see you. I want to extend a special welcome to Dean Sarah Sanders, Dean of the College of Arts and Liberal Sciences, who is here tonight. Um, and of course, I want to welcome uh, John Shellman, who is our uh, speaker tonight, who's going to speak on his, uh, uh, on, among other things, his book, Return to Siberia, which uh, uh, there are still a few copies out there, I think. And I think you'll have a chance to pick it up after, uh, after the reception. Um, also, uh, sorry, after the, the talk. But we are going to have a reception as well. So there's going to be a little bit of food and drink out there after we finish this talk. So do stay, uh, stay around. You'll have a chance to talk to different people, maybe a chance to get John to sign his book, uh, and so on. So I'll definitely recommend this. OK, so I'm not going to introduce John formally, uh, because I'm going to let another very important person here tonight, uh, Jay Holstein, do that. Now, Jay, uh, you probably all know him. He is kind of a legend at this university. He has been teaching at the University of Iowa for 52 years now. Uh, and sadly, he is, uh, at the end of this semester, retiring. Um, but happily, he is actually going to be continuing teaching his, his signature course, uh, Quest, which we are really grateful for. This, but partly by the help of, of John Shalom, this is uh, possible. So uh, I will now let, the, uh, let the Jay take over, and I'll sit down. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. Yeah, 52 years. Goes by in a blink. Don't waste your time, I'm telling you. I remember driving to Iowa City thinking, maybe I'll last here two or three years. Then I blinked, and now it's 52 years later. Uh, I thank you all for coming out on a, on a nasty night like uh, tonight. It'll be worth it, uh, because I get you introduced not only someone who has been a great friend to Jewish studies at this university, but someone who I found out is a friend of mine. We had lunch yesterday. Me and my wife had lunch with him. He's, he's a great guy who has done great things. I mean, we're not talking little things. He has done great things. And I'm not even talking about one day by chance finding himself in the next urinal to Barack Obama as Barack Obama was trying to decide whether to, to run, run for president. And I'm not, not even talking uh, about that, although I have to admit that's it. That's, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, he's here with his wife, uh, his children. He's, uh, uh, I'm no good at introducing uh, people. People, if you do too much, it's no good. If you don't do enough, it's uh, no good. I really appreciate the presence of uh, the dean. That alone should tell you something, uh, uh, that the dean has appeared for uh, this. I uh, welcome Jane Van Voorhees and uh, Kate Metcalf from the University Foundation. It's not called that now, is it? It's called, OK. and. Uh, they, too, have been friends of mine, friends of Jewish studies, for 52 years. From time to time, we ran out of money. The Jewish uh, chair was always uh, funded by uh, private funds, and they were always there. And they raised money with dignity and class, making it seem as if they were lucky to give to something like this. And so they were. Jewish studies was first taught at this university in 1933. You get it? 1933, the year Hitler, Hitler came to power, and uh, it's persisted. It's, uh, I get choked up about it. I can't, I, I can't believe that the university has embraced this, and that the people of the university, there are not a lot of Jews in this uh, university. Uh, there's no reason in and of itself to have a chair of Jewish studies, except there's a reason. Without Judaism, no Christianity. Without the Hebrew Bible, no New Testament. And the people who have held this position, and if you don't understand one other thing and understand this, your uh, uh, presence here 
will be worthwhile. The people who have held this position are widely, widely dissimilar. Jews don't come in one stamp. Uh, uh, Jews are multifarious, and, uh, uh, but they have embraced this country. My grandfather came to this country at the turn of the century when he got on the wrong ship. He uh, uh, couldn't get in the Latvian army because he was circumcised and they weren't accepting Jews. And he was just wandering around. And he, and he thought he got on a ship to uh, Europe and he wound up in the United States of America with not a penny in his pocket. By the time he died, he had the largest trucking company in Philadelphia. That's, but that's, that, that's not it. He loved this country. He loved baseball. He loved everything about this country. Extraordinary country. And we must do, uh, listen, I, uh, we must do everything in our power to keep it whole and uh, sane. And universities are our first and best line of defense. Uh, I say thank God for the University of Iowa, but I understand this is not a religious occasion. So I'm going to say that now. Uh, 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 John John Shalman has made a name for himself where it's hard to make a name for yourself. He has done it in Los Angeles, dash uh, Hollywood. He's no joke an important person, and it astonishes me that he remembers his work at the university and with me in specific. It's bewildering, but I, uh, I love it. Uh, John is, uh, 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 John in and of himself is a paradigm for what Jews have been able to do in this country. And not only Jews, uh, uh, everybody, everybody has a shot. It ain't perfect, we ain't perfect, uh, but uh, I don't think there's any place like it uh, on earth. Uh, for a, time, I, for a time I went to Israel, I had decided to move there. I was never comfortable in Israel the way I've been comfortable in the uh, United States. I mean, thank God for Israel. I, I understand that. Uh, uh, but I've been babbling, uh, babbling long enough. It's time for me to get out of the game. Uh, I want to introduce my friend, uh, John, and uh, thank you. we're lucky to have him. Thank you. Can you hear me? Well, good evening. So happy to see, gosh, whole room, it's amazing. I walked over here from the hotel. I was so cold. <laughs> and it was wet and it was cold. And I'm like, there's not a chance anyone's coming to this. So uh, I'm, just, I'm just really fortunate. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you to uh, Jay Holstein. Who, uh, who means a lot to me, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a lot about Jay tonight in his course because it impacted my life in very profound ways, and uh, you'll be sprinkled throughout this, so I'll keep you away. <laughs> uh, thank you to the department. I appreciate your invite. I am so honored and grateful to be the Sonia Sands lecturer this year. Um, you know, I'm gonna take you on a journey. And it's a journey that hopefully you can relate to on some level, uh, because I was like you. I was just a student at this university, and uh, you know, uh, this man helped give me the map, the map of life, a little bit of a treasure hunt, if you will. But um, I, I just, I'm just so surreal to be back in Iowa City, honestly, uh, walking around and seeing so many familiar structures and so many unfamiliar things. You know, I walked in, I saw Hot House Yoga. It was not here when I was here in 1982. I saw uh, Utopia, I believe. Uh, Yo Frozen Yoga, not here in 82. Uh, smelled a little marijuana as I walked walking over. <laughs> that was here in 1982. So it was, uh, it's been a trip down memory lane. And uh, I titled this talk, The Past is Now. But I really didn't realize how apt that title was until I started walking through this campus and reminiscing about my time at Iowa. It is really surreal. Fifty years ago, my dad got his PhD, Dr. William S. Shulman at the University of Iowa. Thirty-six years ago, his son, me, really received his not so, well, okay, not 
prestigious, as prestigious, not as prestigious as PhD, but I got my bachelor's degree here in Iowa. And my son is going to get his degree here in Iowa. So three generations of Hawkeyes, and it's an incredible thing. Because I, if you are wearing black and gold or bleeding black and gold, on a lot of levels, I don't know most of you, but your family, right? Your family. And I'll tell you how that works. So when I went to LA, I met somebody who uh, grew up in Iowa. Iowa City, went to Regina High School, graduated from the University of Iowa. And be, but for the mysterious forces of the world, we came together. Our kids were going to the same school. And now he's like a brother to me, Rob Watsky. If you're out there watching, you're like a brother to me. Um, just the other day, I was walking my dog, literally walking my dog, wearing my cockeye cap, as I'm apt to do. And someone came over to me, a stranger, he says, hey man, you're from Iowa. And I said, well, I graduated from Iowa. I'm from Rock Island, I'm from the Quad Cities. And he said, I'm from Davenport. We're practically brothers. <laughs> and this is life. You know, you're going to go lots of places in this world and, and you always have your Hawkeye family, which is, which is a super cool thing. Family is central to what I want to talk about today. Uh, now, of course, as it was mentioned, I live in Los Angeles, La La Land, right? Um, Hollywood, where a famous actor can walk on stage and slap a famous comedian in the face <laughs> and minutes later have a trophy handed, a gold trophy, like the golden calf, handed down with people standing with rousing uh, ovation and uh, with their tight faces and toned butts and, you know, their self-absorbed celebrity status and, and that's, that's what happened. And you think that that's L.A., but it's not L.A. I chose L.A. I chose L.A. because it's a beautiful, diverse, creative city. It's an extraordinary city. I found my wife. We've had four kids, I've had a good career there, but we always understand that there's perception and reality often are very different. But it ain't Iowa City, we'll say that. And I don't mind telling you that this trip back has been, uh, you know, I, I really seriously was thinking about when I was wearing a Walkman, anyone know what a Walkman is? You guys still have Walkmans? Is that like a retro thing, like vinyl or something? So we had like literally this thing on my side here with a cassette tape and earphones and walked around and I was listening to probably the John Hughes soundtrack back in the 80s. Um, and you know, my life was full of excitement and purpose and it was exciting. I was free. I was free, the kind of freedom that teenagers feel when you leave your parents' crib for the first time. And, uh, of course, I didn't really know what freedom meant until I found my grandfather's book, uh, who, you know, my grandfather was exiled to Siberia for 10 years, between the age of 15 and 25. So I'm assuming most of you are between the age of 15 and 25. So we'll get into that. But I'll say that before I found his book, I was very, very, very fortunate to have taken a class called Quest for Human Destiny. How many of you have taken or are in that class? Mm, very good, you're lucky. Uh, I was taught by Professor Holstein. Uh, I learned how to analyze and interpret, as you are, the greatest works of literature, from the sacred, you know, the, the Bible, learning about those incredible stories, to Hemingway, we read Hess. Your books have changed a little bit but we read amazing works of art. And because of that training, uh, I realized that what was written by my grandfather, who I didn't met, had never met, would transport me and transform me in ways I couldn't have imagined, but for the fact that I had this course. Because you taught me how to read, and how to look at authors, and how to understand their plight, understanding metaphors and motifs, and, and connections, and building out your own story. So, you know, I go back to 1982 and I remember that day. I think it was Schaefer Hall. It was taking Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, anyone take that class? Do you still have that class? Well, anyway, I don't know what the forces of the world were making me take that class. I think it might have been a requirement back in those days. So as a Jewish kid, I figured I'll get an A in half the class at the very least. Um, and, uh, you know, 
I'll talk about being Jewish for a second because I grew up in a Jewish family, but I grew up in, a, in Rock Island where there weren't many Jews. And I was typically the only Jewish kid in my class. And I wasn't walking around telling people I'm Jewish. I wasn't like wearing it. I was, um, you know, hello, how do you do? I'm John the Jew, nice to meet you. <laughs> Shalom to you, sir. Uh, no, that wasn't me. I was kind of keeping it in. I was holding it close. Um, I didn't want to be different. You know, kids just don't want to be different. I didn't want to be held out. I overcompensated. I, I, I was smart, but I didn't want to be nerdy. I, I wanted to do sports. I don't want to do tough sports. I wrestled. I played football. You know, I didn't want to fit what I thought or perceived to be a caricature that was being portrayed on TV. And that was until that guy walked into the room. Now imagine yourself, Schaefer Hall, big auditorium, doors blow open, Jay Holstein walks in, leather jacket, aviator sunglasses, 1982. And he just blows everyone away. And I thought this, and he said, I'm a Jew, I was a rabbi, we're going to learn about the Jewish Bible. You're going to learn some serious... Can I say shit? No. <laughs> and you'll learn some serious stuff. And he... We were all mesmerized. Like literally all the class, old class, mostly Christian, were looking at this guy. And they were mesmerized and astonished and enlightened that everything he said meant something. And it was bigger than all of us. When you're 18, you don't think about some of the big issues that he's bringing in front of you. But it, it really impacted me. And I thought, he may be the coolest Jew <laughs> I've ever met. And uh, I have to say that, you know, I would go on to take other classes from Jay. Um, but I was proud of Jay. I was proud to be in his tribe. And I was proud to be a Jew. I went on to take classes. Um, but I think you all know and understand what a treasure of Jay Holstein is. He's left an indelible mark on me, on this university, and, in, and tens of thousands of students, probably around the world. So on behalf of that gigantic family of students, Jay, I want to I thank you. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I, I will say to you that because of you, I became a better student, a better thinker, a better storyteller, and appreciate my own spirituality and to help me find answers to life's greatest questions and bring some sense of order to a world full of chaos. Let's hear it for Jay. Right now, the world is full of chaos. The past is now. It's 2022, but it could be 1918, or it could be 1939. War rages in Europe, in Europe. Political unrest and corporate greed threaten the fragile fabric of our interdependent global community. A rapidly mutating virus has caused a pandemic that has claimed millions of lives. Poverty and homelessness abound, wealth gaps, continue to grow, all while technology advances brilliantly. But at what cost? Another terrible world war? Let's hope not. Let's hope we can learn some lessons from the past to help us in the now. That's what Professor Holstein's class taught me. And that's what my book, Return from Siberia, is about. I'm going to click a little, short little, the publishers did this thing, and. It, it's all right. I don't know. We'll see what you think. I'm not trying to. I'm giving it away, so I'm not trying to sell it. Um, the past is now. But, uh, but it was then, too, right? Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean that each and every one of us are a living legacy of the people who made history, who came before you, who survived enough of the calamities that history threw at them, 
war, famine, exile, disease, to create you. That's the one of many things we have in common in this room. Our ancestors were there at the beginning of recorded history. They had to have been. Right? Somewhere. Think about it. When the wheel was invented, when Rome fell, when Einstein imagined light as a particle and a wave, and when the U.S. bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima to end a war that raged and bled all over the world, our ancestors were there. Have you ever spoken to a Holocaust survivor? Or a Japanese American whose family was interned during World War II? Have you ever talked to your parents or grandparents about what it was like when Neil Armstrong took that giant leap for mankind? To live through their eyes just for a moment. Uh, just being, surviving, living through, or being beside what we call history. Living through unprecedented times. We tell stories. We listen to their stories. They're just like us. And now we are, if you look around, we are, all of you, the dreams of our ancestors. The proof of their tenacity, their grit, the fruit of their labor, their lives and their stories. History is written into all of us. Studies in epigenetics have shown how life experiences, experiences alters the expressions of our very genes. Talk about genes for a second. My wife and I got a 23andMe test. Anyone get a gene test ever? Spit in a tube, send it to some nerds in a lab, they send it back and they say, here's who you are, right? Um, is it who you are? I mean, you know, my wife it came back, she's Filipino, we kind of knew that. I'm 99% Ashkenazi Jew with a sprinkle of Finnish, like a garnish, if you will. <laughs> I don't know what a Finnish garnish is, it's probably pickled or herring or both. Anyway, funny thing about 23andMe, it tells you all sorts of little factoids, really interesting little factoids about your haplogroups and your mitochondrial DNA, tracing the paths of distant migrants and shares with you predictions about your health, the time you go to sleep, or whether or not you like cilantro. My wife, I used to say cilantro, which is very Midwestern. She says it's cilantro. I don't think that was a DNA thing, but that's an Iowa thing. Anyway, um, it unleashes secrets. It can solve murders. It can help people find lost cousins. It can do all sorts of amazing things. This isn't an infomercial for 23andMe, by the way. In fact, quite the opposite. Sure, DNA can tell us who we are on a molecular level, but that's just biochemistry. And I would argue that it tells us very little. I believe that the important truths, the real deal, the cosmic insights that can help us understand and thereby live a better life are carried in the stories we tell across generations. And I believe that within these stories lie the answers to the important questions raised by the mysteries of our being. Who were my ancestors? What am I made of? Who am I? Motifs pop up like breadcrumbs scattered about the forest of the past, providing various vantage points of insight and reflection. But you're never going to get handed the whole loaf of your identity. You've got to find those breadcrumbs yourself. It's not easy, but it's worth it. These stories shaped us before we even heard them. You'll see about that. The lessons you learn about yourself will be invaluable. I genuinely believe that a past can help us navigate the present and chart a course towards lives of moral and consequential worth. You just need a minute to take a look and listen. Use the tools at your disposal. Use technology, literary analysis, talk to people, you name it, to find yourself among the faces of the past. Now look, as a proud Hawkeye, I've always had a deep, pride and appreciation for the long legacy of literature at our school. This university is nationally renowned and, uh, for its writing programs. The Writer's Workshop being the cradle of genius really is for countless literary giants. I never thought I'd write a book, even though I came from this great school where they're writing books. and, and being, I never thought I would. I'm a, I'm a political consultant. 
I work with governors and senators and congress members. I do crisis management PR for celebrities, athletes, Grammy award winning musicians. I advise, I strategize, I solve problems, I fix problems, I console. In fact, I do a lot of that, a lot of consoling. I try to provide comfort and consultation to people whose very lives, freedom, and careers are often at stake in a moment. I'm not a rabbi, like Jay, but I have to play one sometimes in Hollywood. I'm also not a great author or novelist, like so many who have walked these hollowed grounds of Iowa City. But so much really did change for me when I found a book. Memoir, bound in dark blue with two pictures printed within of a young man, just a boy, about your age, freshly bandaged after being shot, with very familiar eyes popping out of the page. Those were my eyes. The other picture was the same man, older now, cloaked in thick furs, dark against the endless white snow. My grandfather, Joseph Rako, a socialist organizer who was exiled to Siberia and later emigrated to the United States just before World War I. Now, look, I grew up hearing stories about this guy. He's my grandfather. He's my mother's father. And the incredible stories that were told um, were bittersweet because I never got a chance to meet him. He passed away when my mom was 16 years old. But his memory, his memory was imprinted on her heart, clearly. As were the tales that he regaled, regaled her with about his life of exile and adventure. Joseph was exiled to Siberia, shot not once but twice, and forced into hard labor as just a youth on account of his radical political belief in equality. My mother's father was also a poet and an activist, a man who wrote impassioned letters to the editor about hot-button issues. We might see these in tweets these days, but she was obliged to memorialize them in an old typewriter that he dictated. He was a kind man with a big heart whom she loved to sketch. I knew this much about, my hus about the husband of my only grandparent I ever knew, my grandma Rose, my tough, Yiddish-speaking, son-loving, pie-baking, joke-telling uh, force of a grandmother. But who was this man she was married to? What did he dream about? What led him to live the life he lived? What helped this teenage kid endure 10 years of suffering, exiled from his family to the farthest reaches of the world with no hope of escape and no assurance of survival? Imagine spending those years 15 to 25 in Siberia, Siberia, not for committing a crime, but for having an idea about a more just world. I acquiesced to the fact that I li likely knew all I'd ever know about a man whose sacrifices allowed me to live a life so different from his, until the day I found the book. And finally, I thought I could hear his voice understand the nuances of his life and his sense of humor. There was one problem. The book was written in Yiddish. People know what Yiddish is? It's kind of a tough language to interpret. It's written in Hebrew letters and it's a, it was a challenge. So I'm like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get to the answers to these questions? So my wife and I happened to be driving one of our daughters to school, dropping her off in Amherst, Massachusetts going to Amherst College, and we're driving and we see a sign, literally and figuratively. It said, Yiddish Bookstore and Museum, right on the road. Holy shit. <laughs> we got to go. So we turned off the road, we pulled in, and she, I said, can you find somebody? I've got this book, it's written in Yiddish, it's by my grandfather, exiled in Siberia. Can you find, is there anybody? Said, yeah, that's what we do. So we found someone. And he interpreted the book. As he sent chapter by chapter, poem by poem, page by page, I began to piece together that mystery that haunted my imagination as a little boy. I began to finally merge the myth with the man, a man who was part of me, whose choices and his experiences shaped the course of my life. My grandfather Joe was extraordinary. He was born in a shtetl in Russia in 1888 near the border of Ukraine. 
in what is now Belarus. He loved music. I learned he loved music to this. I even learned that he, he would pluck, he face the wrath of a donkey, but he'd pluck the tail hairs to fashion a fiddle because he so loved the sound, the melodies that he could make. Turns out his love of music was passed on to his daughter, my mom, and to, to many of my siblings, and to, even to my own daughter, who's attempting to be a professional musician. He fought for equality and he raged against injustice, even as a child. The rabbi who taught him his letters was abusive to his students, which Joe had no patience for, so he chose to engage in child labor rather than stay in a classroom, a stuffy classroom, where his hands and face were the targets of smacks. It rings a bell with me about my early passion in politics. And speaking of heads, he had a big one apparently. He, was, he, called him, he said he was known as Narodsky Golovoy, Russian for the head of the people. The fact that he wrote it in his memoir proves he had a self-deprecating sense of humor, which I share with my siblings and my children, uh, maybe sometimes to their chagrin. As a youth, he was pulled towards the Russian so socialist movement, thanks in part to the influence and activism of its older sister. Not just brother, his older sister was leading the activism. The Bolshevik, Bolshevik revolution was still far off, however, and the Tsar's crackdown was uncompromising. He sacrificed for his, fa his family. He took the fall for his siblings' revolutionary activities, and he was ultimately sentenced to 10 years exile in Siberia. Now, Professor Holstein always talked about how the best writing is iceberg writing, right? Heming, Hemingway framed it that way. Much of the meaning, maybe the enormous majority of it, is buried below the surface. We talked about ironic communication, symbols, metaphors. These were the breadcrumbs I needed to follow. So in a sense, Holstein told me how to read this thing, to look at the reading as a means to help you find your own way. Each book we read in your class, sir, acted like a flashlight. A flashlight illuminating a path in the dark. And every book he gave us helped open the world, open our hearts, and into our souls. My grandfather's memoir was a fiery meteor splitting through the night like the one he actually witnessed in Siberia. I'm going to read a quick passage. I looked up at the sky and saw something that made no sense. A fiery streak of blazing light slashing from the heavens to the distant horizon, like a cannonball from God that split the sky in two and filled it with fire. I was engulfed in an instantaneous heat wave, along with a rush of violent wind that blew me off my feet. Trees were uprooted, animals scrambled in every direction. Then, moments later, came a thunderous, booming explosion that shook the earth and sent clouds of dust across the entire sky, obscuring the sunlight and turning day into night. I was stupefied. It felt like the end of the world. I stumbled back to the other villagers, physically shaken but uninjured. We huddled together, not knowing if more terror from the sky would be raining down on us. The enormousness of what had happened left me in both awe and panic. Slowly, as the dust settled, things returned to normal. After many years, many lost years, lost lives, a lost love, a loss of hope that he would ever see his beloved family again, my grand grandfather decided to give up everything. He decided to go to sleep forever in the frigid winter snow. Here's what he wrote. With these heavy thoughts infecting my mind like a cancer, I rose slowly from my bed one night. With a great emptiness in my heart, I wandered out. Wind whistled around me. The snow was thick. I found a clearing and lay down, staring up at the godless sky as snow fell around us and me. With temperatures below freezing, it was only a matter of minutes before hypothermia would take hold, slowing my pulse and circulation and then stopping my breath. 
I close my, my eyes, prepared to end all of it. And then I had the sudden feeling that there was a presence, a force that was around me. I opened my eyes and gasped. My beloved mother was there in the woods with me, clear as day, standing over me with a beatific smile under the falling snow. She didn't say a word, but her presence conveyed volumes. She beckoned me to come. Then the vision vanished in the moonlight. I sprang up from the snow with newfound conviction. My mother was alive, no doubt about it. She was safe in the West with the rest of my family. And so, another heavenly body lit a line across my sky, shook the earth, and swept me off my feet. But this light turned what could have been an endless night into a lasting dawn. My job was to survive Siberia and join them. After his release, Joseph began his journey to America, where his family had relocated. And by the way, they didn't have iPhones, right? Can't find your friend. Can't dial it up. How do you find people, right? This dude's all the way on the other side of the world. He comes back, finds out his family went to America. That, that'll be easy to find, right? They're in that America place. Good luck. So that began a huge journey to find his family. It's a very exciting one. When he flo you know, rolled in the boat passing the Statue of Liberty, he wondered whether Emma Lazarus's promise of a new life to those yearning to breathe free will come true. His dreaminess, his desperate hope, his passion and thoughtfulness in these pages, I began to find myself, my brothers, my sisters, my children, nieces, nephews, all of us in his words, using the tools I learned from Professor Holstein to find the motifs and find the connections. You'll find, if you get a chance to read the book, Return from Siberia, not just the story of Joseph. That would have been easy. I just translated, slap a nice pretty cover on it, and put it out there. What I chose to do instead was my way of reaching back in time to grasp hands with this man whose choices made me, to weave the past into the present, to give my reader the sense of what it's like to find yourself in the past and to find the past playing out again in real time. So my book consists of two parallel narratives, the story of Joseph Rako and his grandson, John. As one leads a campaign to find his family and fight for fair labor practices, the other leads a political campaign for an unknown underdog Latina candidate for U.S. Congress 100 years later. Past and present meld into a story about a single family united by the promise of the American dream. This book becomes a meditation on how turning to the past can help us navigate our present. Now what, what does one glean from narrativizing one's lineage? What happens when you remove your ego from your present to hover above the stage of life and see your loved ones, your ancestors, and yourself as actors propelling a plot forward you hardly realized existed? What happens when you meta yourself so that you can see how your actions are like ripples in a vast body of water that is always moving, always flowing, always reflecting? Some of my LA friends might say you've just found yourself in a interesting transcendental meditation. In my case, I find myself with an idea for a book. So I wrote it. I used what my grandfather left me to pull myself into his narrative. I knew our stories were, in were inherently connected, but I wanted them together, bound in a single book that told the incredible story for everyone to read. I wanted people to recognize and engage with the parallels between now and then. The fights we're fighting, are not new. As my siblings and I say when we refer to our uncanny similarities, we're the same model, just different year. The fight against authoritarianism in the early 20th century and those of modern progressive projects in America are the same fights we see in rallies across the world and in Twitter threads and Facebook posts. In the book, I try not to frame them as mirroring struggles, but as echoing ones. Part of an intergenerational rippling Modern efforts to attain fair wages, openness towards immigrants, and equal opportunities were built on the struggles and the triumphs of the past. Just as I support candidates for Congress today who advocate an American dream that, that, that represents all of us, 
for first, fourth, and fifth generation Americans as well as immigrants. So too did my grandfather, Joseph Rako, help organize unions in Chicago, where many newly arrived immigrant families worked to fight for basic employment protections. This engagement with the past is fundamental to the lessons I learned from Professor Holstein and my grandfather's memoir. His story is not just a series of events, but a rich source of literary possibility. Do you understand? When I read the books with the eyes of Professor Holstein, you don't just look at it like this linear, here's what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened. It's, it takes you everywhere. You look between the lines, and you gain a new perspective and understand it. That's what reading is. That's what understanding how it can become that flashlight into your own heart. Shortly after, before his exile, for example, Joe's sister, Sonia, gives him a pearl earring. And he makes him a promise to never lose faith in the possibility of reuniting with the other, which remains in her possession. The pearl becomes just one of the book's motifs. Another way family reaches out their metaphorical hands to span the distance of time and place, to connect and to promise eternal connection. Because in our shared stories and in our shared blood are bonds of life that can never be broken. Certain things fall into patterns. Life falls in a sense of pattern of destiny. Just as my grandfather's experience with socialism led to his political activism in America, so you'll see how John's father, my dad, pats him on the back when he successfully fights for school funding as a high school student in his hometown of Rock Island, Illinois, carrying on the family tradition of realizing the value of passion, hard work, and service to others. And just as kismet gives Joseph an enduring source of hope as chance encounters with beautiful women and asteroids and pearls remind of that trail of breadcrumbs sprinkled by God, so kismet is a guiding light for my entire family. Now one trusts that a century hence, yet another generation will find within it the stories that precede their lives and enduring lessons of love, survival, and honoring one's past to guide them on their own journeys. My grandfather's story showed me that I was not alone in my quest. I was part of his and he became a big part of mine. It's a continuum. I learned that my life is not a novel. It's just a chapter. So here we are. We're here together in Iowa. In this room, but um, you know, in a cosmic sense, quote Sagan, we're on this planet together. It's a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam, alone in the vastness of space, but held together by bonds as strong as the gravitational force that pulls us to the core of the world, held together by love, loyalty, and family. We are the stories we tell. Our stories inform how we think of ourselves and in turn, how we treat each other. It's important to understand. One of the greatest examples of ironic communication with the authors of the Bible by the way, I didn't know there were authors of the Bible. I went in thinking, God wrote it, right? I said, no, no, no. These are really smart people. And they had stories to tell. They had to read between the lines. God created a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, and two sons. You think they didn't know they couldn't populate the world with the parents of two sons? Right? They must have meant something else. We had to be smart and look at this. They must have meant something else. What did they mean? If all humanity comes from a single set of parents, what does that make us? Anyone? If we all came from a single set of parents, what does that make us? Family. All of us. Even people who don't look like us, who don't live like us, whose values are different from us, we're all family. Maybe not all Hawkeye family, but we're all family. And if we're family, then we're responsible for one another. We need to care for one another. That's the real truth of that story. And I hope the truth of mine. I left the University of Iowa 36 years ago, transformed. A different person left here. And a different person is now standing here. I will continue to evolve, 
I will continue to learn and to grow, to challenge myself. You will all leave Iowa at some point, transformed in some way yourself. You'll leave your friends, your family, classmates, go your separate ways, do your separate things, live your separate lives on your journey, on your quest. So let me ask you this. What will be your Siberia? What mountain will you have to climb? What ceilings and walls will you have to break through? Will you survive it? And who do you hope to become on the other end? What will inspire you? What will, who will love you and who will you love? What stories will you tell? And what stories will be told about you? You all have a story. If I had a story, you all have a story. Your eyes have and will see the world in a unique way. So find a way to share what you know, what you've discovered. Talk to your grandparents, your parents, Professor Holstein. Listen and learn. Tell your story and tell their story. Contribute to the world that which is precious, beautiful, and yours. Write a book. Write a novella. Write a poem. Make music. Make art. Touch the world in a special way. As the Bible teaches, you were created in the image of the Creator, so there is creativity in you. And there is great joy, great joy in creativity. The past is now. And real success is not measured the way I think you think it is. I'm around a lot of really super high charged successful people, I am. The ultra rich, the powerful, famous. But all that crap doesn't mean anything. There's another kind of success. It is not the success of achievement, advancement, or acquisition. I learned from my grandfather's exile to Siberia that the journey toward this kind of success does not follow linear logic of economics, of investment and return, but a moral logic, which is paradoxical. You give in order to get. You sacrifice in order to gain. In empathy for the suffering of the other of others, you learn the power of the self to heal. Only in losing yourself will you ever find yourself. Humility helps us become painfully aware that we are not the sole authors of our destiny. You are not self-made. You are the product of myriad acts of self-sacrifice by others who created you and who created this world. You are not assured of opportunities, but you can build those opportunities out of humility and out of gratitude. Everything grows, and you have the greatest potential. So, with great humility and gratitude, I thank my Hawkeye family for indulging me tonight and riding along on this little camp bus journey. <laughs> And, um, and so I thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Where did you find your grandfather's book? It was at my parents' home in an attic. And, uh, you know, I talk a little bit about kismet. Anyone know the word kismet? What's it mean to you? It's like the action of fate. Hmm? Meant to be, right? Fate. Yeah. Kismet, we talk about this. How did I wind up in this man's class? There's so many other options provided by the University of Iowa. But I found myself there, and I find myself here. A big part of my journey was that. A big part of my journey was finding a book. And uh, thank God. Right. Any other questions? Yes? What was your favorite book that you read, either in Quest or just in general? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, 
You know, it's interesting because in Quest we read so many interesting books. I really loved the Hemingway component of our of our class discussion for some of the reasons I discussed. Where you know the metaphors and and uh, you know the old man and sea. Of course, you probably are you reading it now or you've already read it. Um, I love the old man and sea. One, it was short. I really liked that. <laughs> when I was in college, I was like, don't give me war and peace, man. You know, just the war part of the peace part. Um, I loved Old Man and the Sea. I thought it was a really moving book. But it's also everything connected, right? So, so it was just a genius way to put together a, a class. By the way, he stands up here. Has he told you it's a little nothing class? It doesn't teach you anything. It's not really important. It's a little nothing. Yeah. That's bullshit. <laughs> It's a huge class. It's a really big class with big questions and big possibilities. It opens you up to everything. I mean, from reading Ecclesiastes, you know, when you're 18, you don't think you're gonna die. You're just like, what are you talking about? I don't wanna think about that stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very meaningful. There, there are so many books. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird was really meaningful to me. I read it at a young age and it just sort of in, imprinted in my my being, who I wanted to be in my life. Um, but there are so many great books, and you know, the fact that I had a chance to write one was really cool. I'll, I'll maybe try to do another someday, but it was just uh, it's such a passion project. It was just such so personal that um, I felt like I had to get there. I think there's a book in every single one of you, by the way. There is a book. And don't tell me you haven't had an experience where you stood, to, you know, sort of stood back and said. That'd make a pretty good scene, right? Everyone has. So write them down. Write them down for you, but write them down for your children. You know? Because they want to get it. They want to get the angst. Don't varnish everything to kids. They want to understand you struggle too. It was hard. Life is hard. If you tell them it was wonderful, no problems at all, and they're going to always look, why am I so messed up? you didn't tell them that you were messed up too. And that's what it, being a human being is. Any other questions? Yes? So, oh, well, it's just right in my eye there, sorry. <laughs> no, well, actually, it was right behind you. Oh. But now that's you sorry. have to think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, life is full of challenges. Yeah. So, um, what do you think for you or may have expected for you and to not meet that expectation <coughs> can be really debilitating. So with people I talk to in my career who have crises in their life, often it's because, you know, they're, they have expectations that are unreal. Will my next record hit number one? How many downloads? How many this? Right? Will I 
you know, win an Academy Award? Will I do all these things? The expectations, the, comp the, the competition is so intense. If you can extract people from that world, say, hey man, <laughs> like we're trying to do here, life is way bigger than you, right? You, you aren't the center of the universe. Chill. It's okay. Fail. It's fine. As I said at the end here, that's how you become better. You find yourself when you lose yourself. So giving people the okay, it's okay. It's like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Right? And if you can accept that, if you can learn to, I don't want it, but I can, I can live with it. Um, they can go the other direction very quickly. That's my experience. You know, my, my grandfather's experience of trying to find, you know, following the breadcrumbs of God, right, Kismet, is um, he, he was not a religious man. He wasn't a religious man. He had really bad experience in Hebrew school. He got beaten up because he couldn't pronounce things correctly. Right? So he said, forget that. I don't want to do that. I don't believe in that. He got a really bad you know, unfortunately for him, a bad sort of shake on Judaism, that was okay. He had a different kind of religion, right? His spirituality. It took him to a Lower East Side synagogue when he had lost everything. He felt he had nothing. And it renewed him for that next battle. He was constantly having these incredible moments where it was over. And something would happen. Some light would shine that would keep him going ultimately to be able to reunite with his family. I don't want to give it away though. Of course I'm here, which means he must have reunited with people to make me. Never mind. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? As a great storyteller, what do you make of our current situation in the United States where it appears to me that groups of people are living in very, very different mutually some of them seem to relate to facts, some don't, uh, to the point where uh, we don't even know what facts means. So I think you're so right. We, I mean, I think we need to be able to tell the national story of this uh, unraveling. It's just, it feels really devastating. This is a little bit of an iceberg question. There's, there's a lot to that. I know what you're saying. Um, I spent a lot of time with elected leaders. And uh, I'm a Democrat. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean anything on a lot of levels. I'm an American. I'm a human being. I care about people. I care about a better world. I want to protect our environment. I feel like I should leave this world better than we, we inherited it. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on that. And a lot of people don't believe in the same thing. A lot of people are operating off of different facts. And there's not a lot we can do other than educate the hell out of people early. Now, at the end of the day, you are a product of your education. And that could be at home with your parents. It's also certainly your early elementary and middle school and high schools and here. Explore. Take advantage of the opportunity to be on a college campus and learn about other people. You know, I took Judeo-Christian tradition. I wanted to learn about Christian tradition. This is the Department of Religion. You have everything here to study and look at. And religion has created problems around the history of the world. We know that, right? Our facts are different. Our interpretations are different. But here we are today. And communication is so important. So when I talk to my clients, I said, there ain't enough money to, you, you, there's never too much money to spend in education. Because at the end of the day, the kind of kid that comes out of the school, the transformation that happens from their home through school, the impact that a good teacher can have, a great professor can have, can change people's lives and hopefully in a way that will unite us and not divide us. So it's a tough question. Um, but I always start with communication and education is the answer. Thank you. I 
Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, I think all in, it was four years. All in. Now, I always tell people, I sort of wrote half a book. <laughs> but I really had to, there's a lot of time. And I have a full-time job, right? So, yeah, if I was a novelist and this was my thing, I'd be typing away. Uh, but I didn't have that kind of time. I had to do research. You know, when he was describing where he was, I, thank God for Google, right? I was able to Google map his travel. Like, this is the way the train went, you know? And, uh, and that was an amazing thing for me to be able to research and sort of follow his footsteps through this process. So uh, it took a while, but I was really, and, and that includes, that includes getting it published and, and getting it out, right? So um, I was very fortunate to get published and really fortunate that you know, in the early weeks of this launch, people really kind of got into it. There was something about it that connected to people. Um, and uh, we were in the middle of a presidential campaign. Some people were ca comparing. There's a brother uh, conflict in this, by the way. Sibling conflicts happen. But, you know, he took the fall for his siblings to be the true socialist, even though he's still learning about it. He's 15. His older siblings were, like, locked in. They were socialists. And so he goes 10 years, and he says, I'm, he's really a socialist after that. Comes to America, guess what? His brother's a capitalist. His brother's building skyscrapers, making big money. His brother became everything he was supposed to. And so naturally, that's a huge conflict that um, I wanted to explore based on conversations with my mom. I wanna look, did you hang out with your cousins? and? Like, because he had kids and they had kids. Was there a relationship there? And she said, oh my God, no. Like, it was a problem. And literally, there is a wing at the Chicago Art Institute named after his brother, who changed his name. And uh, it's a very interesting story. But I really wanted to get every nuance about it. So it took a little time. Any other questions? Cool, gosh, you guys, you guys are smart, and I so appreciate your being here. Um, I know you could be other places. I, maybe some of you have a homework assignment. I hate being a homework assignment, but do your assignments. No, uh, really, really, really glad that you guys had a chance to come out. My uh, wife just whispered in my ear that she wants to ask. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, who would you cast as your grandfather in the film? Yeah, <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> uh, let's see, you know, it's been suggested by my children that Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> but I'm like, isn't he in everything? I'm open to suggestions, so I feel free. He's got to play somebody who was 15, or maybe they transitioned to 25, and then, you know, we don't go much beyond that. But. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm open to any casting suggestions or any casting agents who might be sitting here, <laughs> lurking, interested. Um, you guys are amazing. Thank you all so Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Us. And if you even care for a signature, I'm happy to give it to you if you have a book. We, we uh, have a limited number. And it's really strange because they, um, they're having to do a second printing, which is really good news for an author. Like, we ran out. But uh, you can find them on Amazon. If you didn't get one tonight, I think they're a lot cheaper than they were. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, and also don't forget we have some uh, food and drink out.